This week we're featuring Celestite, an interview with Paul Hallisey, Blue Adventuring under the microscope cam, tortillas on Why'd I Buy That, 14 new jokes, and now with lower levels of Why Am I Watching This? A magician ordered a pizza but didn't like the flavor, so he added some basil and shouted, Pesto Changeo! Let's start the show. I like this Celestite. It's it's nice. It's hard to get good barite with clarity and color and hardness. This stuff is way too soft. Way too soft. It's kind of why I couldn't get it as straight as I wanted it to. Straight as I wanted it to be. Sharice, welcome to the show. Sharice, I missed your text. I won. Yay. I'm so excited. I wound up celebrating. I hope you're doing well. Stayed up a little too late celebrating. I found that the Village Theater is going to be, or, well, they are live streaming the open mic that's going on right now. I wanted to kind of get through this show so I could try to make it to that open mic before it's over. <sighs> Hope you're having a good week. Hope you're ready to start making a great week out of this week. Man, that was a lot of fun. And also, a little side note, the Village Theater, that link I dropped, that is the place where the contest was. So that's the thing. How are you doing? Hope all is well. I know it is because you're great like that. Wasn't sure about which joke I should start the show with. And then I decided at the last minute I'd do the, the basil one because of Paul's answer to the lottery pizza question. So let's see. Yay, congrats. Yes, awesome. I am so happy. That was awesome. The, there's only one problem with it, though. See, the joke is that only the that fun the funniest people never win comedy competitions and so if i ever win a comedy competition then i'll be worried and i won well with the help of matt miller we we carried each other pretty well he uh he wrote a lot of good jokes and I, I had once we got to the roast portion, I had a couple of of uh, roasts ready to go. So I used those when I got up there and scored some points. I was glad I was prepared, you know. I'm not really good at roasting people. That's not really my style. But I enjoyed enjoyed competing. And Matt, Matt was great because, like, he would write down a whole bunch of jokes when we had to write jokes on the fly. Yeah, that was a thing, too. We'll get into that during the joke portion of the show. Let's get into the microscope portion of the show. Yes, I am live early because I want to get through the interview and get to that open mic. Because I want to get to... The open mic and show everyone. Here's the gem of the day, the Celestite. Nice little oval. I was having trouble holding it, and I'm using a dull 1000, and it still just eats this stuff away like nobody's business. Glad you had a good time. I am too. 
I wish I had more people there to see me win. That would have been cool. <laughs> um. Okay, so we go to desktop. Joke intro camera. And we can pull up the camera for the camera portion of the program. I'm going to zoom in before I click over. Oh, that's it. We're already ready already. Okay. Microscope portion. So you can kind of see in the in the picture of the video there the basic shape that it started to turn out to be. Then it wound up not being as straight as I wanted it to. I couldn't because just any bit of touching the lap eats it away, and I was afraid of chip outs. And I got rid of the chip outs without getting rid of all of the stone. That's one of the biggest problems is having a lot of breakout. It's a very soft stone. I want to say it's like a 3. We'll look it up here in a minute. A 3 out of 10. There we go. You can see me try to shape it a little bit more. I shouldn't have shaped it much, but I had to get rid of the cracks in the backside. Which those will be coming up. Celestite. It is a three to three and a half out of ten. So yes, it is very, very soft. Beautiful gem. I like it. So it's really thin, too. Let's see. The hard part with doing this is getting the lines straight on the back, really. And that's where I had the most trouble. Because one of them will even down on the inside or even down on the outside. And then when I'm trying to straighten one, like push on the outside a little more or the inside a little more, sometimes it'll turn. And what I mean by turn is this surface will become two surfaces. Like it'll be like this and I'll put it on there and I'll pull it away and it'll be like this. And so then I've got to eat that down. And when I'm eating it down, some of the rest of it goes. And then the other four of them have to go with it. And so I sit there and play guess when it's enough. Then on top of that, trying to eat the, the girdle on it was really hard. And then trying to eat the edge facet on the girdle was also just as difficult. But I didn't have any breakout, any major breakout getting through this stone which is nice because that's a big problem with this celestite i've had a few of them that i tried to get through and they just did not shape they didn't work out i went wound up grinding them into almost nothing mm -hmm. soft soft is kind of good because it shapes easy but this is too soft it's way too soft i mean it polishes easily but it like i say it, it chips out yeah, I got to use too fine of a grid. I need to actually, what I should do for shaping this is maybe try to break out my 2000 grit lap wheels. I've used those before and they, uh, they never really work that well for most stones, but maybe it would work pretty well for this, for the barite. Coming up, I think I'm going to be shaping this blue aventurine. It's got a lot of speckles in it. I shaped a piece of this at like a, year, a little over a year ago, I think I shaped some. I think this is only the third piece I've ever shaped. And this is <clears throat> this layer here is the rough outside of the stone, and then it was cut into slabs, and I bought it as a slab. And I think I cut this side off and broke this side off. Let's see if I can zoom in on it a little better. It's got those lines of matrix in it. 
and the harder it's it's kind of a quartz derivative but it's got sparkles in it little sparkle bubbles and then it's got the black speckles so this will be fun I think I'm gonna get into shaping this next oh it's pretty I'm glad you like it hey 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 how you way did you do your way he's eating jujubes one other thing oh here's the the piece of blue adventuring the wedge probably keep it pretty wedgy it's pretty straight forward shape and here's another one this is some amazonite that i'm working on i don't have it polished yet but i think i'm actually gonna feature it um in a couple of weeks we'll see if it turns out hopefully it doesn't fall apart that's a hundred grit hundred grit cut right there no polish yet we'll just it'll shine up as i polish it so that's gonna be a thing yeah anyways that's what i got for the microscope portion of the program little bit all of those to show you the back side's got like a lot of white stuff on it and i like to feature more of the turquoise portion because this is like a chalcedony with turquoise in it and they call it amazona and it's got a lot of white stuff in it and some of it i have has a lot of like bubbles which is really cool and i was gonna feature one of those i think i showed it under the microscope a couple weeks ago you are a bubble because I like to be blowed? No, that sounds so wrong. Back it up a bit. Um, let's see. So anyway, that's what we have for the microscope portion of the program this week. I thought about showing this. I think I might have showed this last week. This is a piece of lemon quartz that I started working on. Started working on it last week. Didn't get any time to process it. Maybe I started working on it this week. It's still rough on the back side. But I got the basic front side shape done. So that kind of shows you the, the rough outside of it. And I'm hoping I don't lose that deep, dark yellow color as I get through it. Because see, when I turn it just right, it's like it gets pale. I'm hoping I don't cut it out, but the color isn't very zony. It's not like zone shaped. It's pretty even throughout. So I'm kind of excited about that. Anyways, that's what I got for the microscope portion. What do I what what did I buy? What did I buy and why did I buy it? Tortillas. I bought tortillas. Yes. But look at that. There are a lot of tortillas to buy. I didn't even... that. I was standing up against the aisle with my phone like inside my face when I clicked the picture. And still couldn't get all of the tortillas that they have. What do you guys think about when I take a picture down the aisle looking at all of the, the tortillas from down the aisle a little ways? Do you like it when I have a couple of different pictures? I didn't get one because there were so many people at the store and I didn't want to try and take a picture when there's people. And man, was there a lot of people. Frustratingly, a lot of people. Oh, I'm switching from the 240 grit, which does the rough shaping, to the 1000 grit, which still ate away way too much material. I mean, a lot of times I can let it ride on the 1000 grit a little bit, but this thing was just so soft incredibly soft but still translucent enough to be beautiful and show the beauty of the stone but right now i'm talking about the beauty of tortillas i bought tortillas because i wanted to make tacos i've probably talked about tortillas before but I, I bought a different kind this time because i wanted to get something different than what i'm used to and i can't find in the walmart which maybe they don't have them in walmart maybe they just have them in the jewel store where do they have the refrigerated tortillas in the refrigerated section right still couldn't find them too many options too many products couldn't couldn't find them couldn't choose them so i had to choose from these ones that are in the aisle and they have the, all the corn tortillas they have the flour tortillas and i'm like mm, 
Not really big on corn tortillas, more of a flour tortilla guy for the most part, you know. So I'm like, unless it's a double-decker taco, mm, those are so good. Uh, but I bought these flour tortillas, right? And they got they got a big, like, like over on the far side where the shelves get different, they got a huge selection of Mission brand tortillas. But those are real thick and like fluffy and i'm not really into those i want the thinner ones the more matted down ones and so like the chi chi's ones are okay i've never tried the ortega ones and i remember i didn't get the ortega ones last time because like the expiration date was so far along and i was like mm, they could probably got a lot of preservatives in them maybe they're just well preserved so i bought the chi chi's ones because i was like oh they're probably pretty fresh and maybe they'll be good. And they were. They were good. I'll get them again. I'll probably try the Ortega ones next time. Not sure about like the Taco Bell ones that they have. I'm not sure if they have Taco Bell flour tortillas. I didn't take the time. Mostly I was there to get it and get out. So I just I chose the Chi-Chi's because they were there. And they were easy to read. And I could tell what I was buying. And I could see in the package. So I bought them. And that's what I bought. And that's why I bought that. Have you ever bought tortillas? And which ones did you buy? And why did you buy that? I don't know. That's why we're trying to solve the mystery. Speaking of mysteries, let's talk about some jokes for the joke portion. Oh, actually, uh, We've got the interview. I wanted to do the jokes and then, or do the interview and then do the jokes. How about that? Let's do that part. Now you can see me trying to eat the side, but I still didn't have the girdle straight. I think I might take this gem back in and, and, and run it to try and even it out. I've done that with a couple of gems before, but I just didn't have enough time and I'm not going to have enough time for the next few days. Okay, let's get to the interview, if I can find the interview for a portion of the program. So, just to give you a little backstory, Tom Kelly from the Tom Kelly Show introduced me to Gladys Simon. And I started doing Gladys's online open mic. And she features a lot of comedians from the New York City area. Practicing their comedy routines online in the open mic Zoom style format. And I offered to interview comedians that were participating in Gladys's open mic. And Paul very courteously offered to join us for an interview and talk about doing comedy and the comedy scene. Let's see what he has to say, shall we? Joining us today, we have comedian, author, entertainer, and star, Paul Hallisey. All right. Thank you for joining us, Paul. Thank you. So, Paul, I met you through Gladys, mm -hmm. through the online Zoom mic, yeah. and I met you through your comedy. So I wanted to ask you um, a couple questions about comedy. But first, I'd like to ask you the get-to-know-you question we ask all our guests. Uh oh If you won the lottery and you went for pizza, what would be your lottery pizza? My lottery pizza? Oh, gosh. Well, if I could, I don't know. I mean, the first thing I thought of is I, I actually live in the neighborhood where, you might not know this if you're not a New Yorker, but... Um, there used to be a pizza place called Ray's Pizza. Now, in New York City, there are about a million places called Ray's Pizza, and some of them claim to be the original Ray's, famous Ray's, but mine really was the original Ray's Pizza. And uh, unfortunately, what's happened is that in the last, I don't know, just in the last few years, it has become such a tourist trap there are actually lines outside the door when i go grocery shopping saturday morning so people are apparently having pizza for breakfast i don't know but it's like it used to be like a neighborhood place and they used to have 
a, a really good Italian restaurant next door, which is now closed. But uh, yeah, they used to have a really good, uh, actually, I mean, I haven't been there because like you can't even get near it anymore. But uh, I used to like the uh, the pesto pizza. That mm. was my uh, thing. And now, um, you know, again, my just, just in my neighborhood, like within like a, a two block radius, there's like, actually in my building, in my apartment building itself, there's a pizza place on the ground floor. But I don't really like that pizza place, mainly because it's kind of like a de facto after hours club. Mm. Uh, but there's another one around the corner that has, uh, I just started going to recently, and they have, uh, what uh, the two that I get is, they have like a, uh, I think it's a, 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 a sausage and broccoli is one. And then they have another one that I think is like pesto and mushroom. So yeah, so. That, what uh, is, pesto. what is pesto? Are you asking me what is pesto? Wow, you really don't live in New York. Uh, <laughs> pesto is like a sauce that's made with olive oil and basil, basically. I think it has a few other ingredients, but that's the main thing. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll have to ask Colette about that because she used um, my gemstone plant food to grow basil this year. And uh, so I'll have to ask her if she's ever made pesto before. Uh, and so what you're saying is that if you had lottery dollars, just money coming out your ears, yes. you would get yourself a front, a front of the line pass for the real original Former, one of a kind, yeah, laser former rays. rays pizza. I think now it's called Prince Street Pizza, but you know, you know. If it's still just as good, it's still a beautiful pizza, right? It's probably still good, but you know, I, I just re resent the fact that tourists have taken over my neighborhood, basically. <laughs> right. I understand that. Yeah. That. Well, that was the thing. Like, I went to New York, and I really appreciated how cool it was to just like go out of the hotel because I was at the Manhattan at Times Square. So I could just walk down and check out Times Square. I could walk down and check out uh, Central Park. But then I was like, how many of these people are tourists and how many, how much of the real New York am I getting the feel of? And so I, I was like, next time I go back, I gotta, I gotta check out more of the city. Yeah. What, what hotel were you at in Times Square? Man, the Manhattan at Times Square. Oh, are you sure? Is that the Marriott or? No, it's, 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 it's called, called Manhattan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's, it's on 7th Avenue and like 52nd Street. Okay. A little and, bit of Times Square, but okay. Yeah. And it's, um, it's a hotel, I guess. Yes. <laughs> it, it was affordable. How's that? Okay. Well, you know, I was going to say, if you walk a few avenues west of Times Square to Ninth Avenue, there's an actual neighborhood there called Hell's Kitchen, mm. which is uh, actually that's become sort of like the premier gay neighborhood in, in, in Manhattan right now. I mean, it used to be Chelsea, and before that, it was the West Village. So, um, and, uh, you know, and also it's the theater district, so a lot of actors live there. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's a real part of New York, not a lot of touristy... Yeah, like I, mean, I said, you just have to walk like two avenues west and you'd be in a real neighborhood. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, I because I mean, I walked like 40 miles in two days. It was... Wow, wow. Yeah, I, I walked uh, all the way down to the Comedy Cellar. I walked all the way wow, up okay. to the Comic Strip. I walked um, all the way around Central Park. Oh. My, like, by the time I was headed home and I got out of the car to get gas the first time, I was walking like a crack addicted, uh, disabled Civil War veteran. Uh, my legs were shutting down. <laughs> we do have subways here. I don't know if you're aware of that, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, I I was enjoying it at the time, you know. Oh. But uh, but yeah, I'm definitely gonna have to. I I I appreciate the the uh, public transportation now. That's for sure. Yeah, I'm gonna have to check that out. Um, but, you know, that, that'll that be in, like, I'm thinking March, as long as I don't have too much work coming at me, then it, it all depends on, because, like, like, with the construction business, usually uh, things get busy in, like, the, the middle of springtime, but not early springtime, and then they get busy again just before it gets cold outside, 
people are like, oh, we, we need to get this done before, yeah. you know, the weather changes. And so um, there's basically two times when I get really busy. And, and so I'm thinking before that, but when the weather warms up, if I can hit that sweet spot. Yeah. You know. But um, so anyways, uh, what got you into comedy? Uh, well, originally, well, I, I guess I should back up and say like, this is like, um, I've had several sort of creative careers, so, so to speak. I mean, uh, cause, uh, I, I, well, I guess, you know, it's cause I sent you all that information, but, uh, you know, I wrote a book and, um, uh, what, I guess what you wouldn't know is that I, I, I was doing shows as a singer before I started doing comedy and okay. yeah. And the reason I started doing comedy initially was because. I felt like I didn't fit into the gay community. So that, I know you're shocked. So a lot of my comedy was about that specifically. And uh, I mean, I still have that material. I don't know how much of it I've done lately, um, but you know, I talk about other things as well. It's not just, you know, that, but that was, that was like my initial impetus, I guess. So you were looking for camaraderie um i don't know about that i mean i i, I bas basically needed to get things off my chest and the ironic thing is uh and this kind of like fits in with the not fitting to the gay community part is that i found that that material went over better with straight audiences than gay audiences because you know it's almost like i'm educating straight people about what it's like to be gay at least at least you know more sort of like from a cultural perspective okay and, and uh so it's interesting to them but it's like because i i used to do this um i want to call it like a gay open mic even though it was you know open to everyone but it was you know it was i guess predominantly gay and it's kind of like like all the cool gays were sort of like would hang out in the back and sort of like you know be judgmental and you know so it's like when i would talk about these issues i had with the gay community i feel like their reaction was like oh what's her problem you know uh so yeah actually so i let's just say i don't do that mic anymore but <laughs> um yeah yeah i find straight or mixed audience have, have been more receptive um just in general and i and and i i, I don't like what i call ghetto wise shows you know, like where they have like an all gay lineup or an all black lineup or an all, or, you know, whatever it is. Like I, I like, I mean, and, and now I'm producing shows. So it's like, I like to have a diverse lineup just for myself. Um, I think it makes for a better show and um, yeah. You can get a bigger audience all together. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, and it's like, I, I feel like with these, um, ghetto wise shows in general and about i guess i should talk about gay shows in particular i i feel like um there's i mean you know i'm not saying anything new here really but it's like i think you get labeled as a gay comic or there's a feeling that oh well he's he only gay people like him or you know something like that which is actually the opposite from my experience because like i said i mean i i, I find quite i found quite the opposite but it kind of depends, you know, it's, it's sort of like there's the cool gays and the not cool gays of, of which I would consider myself a member. So um, like for a long time, actually about 18 years, I used to host this event called the Gay Business Expo, which was, took place on a, a, you know, a Saturday and Sunday afternoon when most of the cool gays would still be asleep. Uh, in fact, it used to coincide with something called the Black Party, which was like a very cool cool gay circuit party which i guess that's the that whole <laughs> i would have to explain all these terms to you but um i, I just I, i'm just saying that it's like it, it was not a place where the cool gays would would be and that's where i was at and, and i got i actually got a good reception from from them because you know they weren't cool so they 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 understood my pain <laughs> you know Okay, so uh, some some comedians talk about um, that they like the the therapy. I guess I don't really know if therapy is the right word, but they they like the outlet. They like being able to to just get up on stage and and talk about things to get them off their chest. So, is that kind of what got you started? And then you and then you developed. Yeah, your... I mean that, that's part of it. So yeah, so like when I started, I you know I specifically wanted to get certain issues I had about the gay community off my chest um okay so but yeah but just in general yeah that's totally 
um, therapeutic. I mean, hopefully it's also funny. I mean, you don't want to just get up on stage and complain. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, no. No, you yeah. know, you have a comedic angle to, to, I mean, you're not up there, you're not the guy who bitches, you're not the guy who uh, yells into the microphone. <laughs> well, I mean, I sort of do, but I try to also have a punchline. I mean, there are people who just, I'm actually thinking of one comic in particular that I saw on some Zoom open mic I did, and I was like, well, he's not funny, he's just yelling. I mean, and that's, you know, you need to have punchlines, you know, you can't just yell. Yeah, so, yeah. I hope I'm not doing that. I mean, you know, I, I hope I have punchlines, but <laughs> no, you're you're really you're talented. That's why I, I wanted to interview you for the show. Which yeah. brings me to my next question. Uh if you were gonna give some tips to yourself, you know, now if you mm -hmm. wanted to give some tips to yourself when you were just starting comedy, um could could you give any any advice to our our, our new comedians out there? tips to me or just like it sounds like you're asking for like tips to newcomers in general well in general but uh just to kind of inspire yourself what what would you have told yourself or oh. or e either one i mean it's a pretty loose interview well you know when i started out um i i took this class for about 15 years <laughs> I, I i the class is kind of a, a misnomer because it was really more like an open mic with constructive criticism mm, so okay. So, you know, it was like 10 years before I even did an open mic. So that's, you know, so that's the thing I would say about open mics is don't expect to get, well, certainly don't expect to get constructive criticism from an open mic. I mean, either people are going to laugh or not. And right. so open mics tend to be populated almost exclusively by other comedians. <laughs> there, there are good chances that you're not going to get any laughs. So... I wouldn't uh, put too much stock in open mics. I mean, I don't know. Okay. I get maybe if you can find one, like you know, I like Gladys's group because um, it's uh, how shall I say a little bit older. I mean, if you go to open mics, at least the ones I've been to in 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 New York, you know, it's usually a bunch of twenty year old guys talking about their penis. So <laughs> that's you know, it's, that's not really going to get you very far. And then you yeah. Know, and the other thing about open mics that really, you know, I, and again, this is why I actually like the Zoom format because I don't have to leave my apartment and I'm very lazy. <laughs> um, so, you know, so that that's the other thing about open mics is that, you know, a lot of times you have to sit through like two hours of other comedians doing their, you know, three minutes or whatever. And... Um, a lot of times it's not funny um and somehow you're expected to put together like a one hour set from that like i don't know how i don't know how that happened you know because it's like it'd, it'd be so time well i guess that's why a lot of comedians leave immediately after their set but <laughs> you know it would just be extremely time consuming and very taxing on one's patience i think yeah i i i i can actually vouch for a a lot of what you said about the open mics that it's mostly just comedians who are there to try out their material right and they stand in the back of the room there's a, a new york comedian that i found named adam gable and he uh, uh he, he's been doing the west side comedy club okay. lately he's he's going to be filming a special but he said uh you know i'm i'm going to be filming a special and the back of the room is already sold out because he was talking about the other comedians. I, I, I probably screwed up his joke, but uh, oh. he's, he's talking about how the open mics, there's always a bunch of other comedians there, and they stand in the back of the room. Oh. And Well, usually that's all there is. There's usually, like, no quote-unquote real audience, as I refer to them. Although sometimes, I mean, I, again, this open mic that I was referring to sometimes got a little bit of audience, hmm. just, I, I think just because of where it was located. But the point i was trying to make was that the cool kids so to speak stood in the back mm. and the weird thing is there there would be like a couple of straight people up front like that were like you know digging my material but it's like the the cool gays were in the back going oh what's she all about you know what's her problem you know that kind of thing yeah <laughs> like comparing themselves to your cop I, I actually have a joke where i i say uh my jokes are funny enough to make you laugh but not funny enough to make you jealous Oh, it's a uh. it, yeah. I don't know. It's kind of a a, a personal dig. Um, but uh, 
thinking about um you know the 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 other comedians at the open mics it's like they're they're focusing on their material right. and so they're thinking about their set they're not really paying attention to yours yeah. And so you don't really get to see if your jokes are, are going to make an audience laugh so much as you just get right. experience standing on stage and holding a microphone. Well, that reminds me of another thing, because even apart from open mics, just like doing real shows, um, you, know, I, I, you know, I have found many times that I have done the exact same material for two different audiences and gotten two completely different responses. So, so some, sometimes it really is the audience's fault, you know, sometimes the audience really does suck and it's not you. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I, I hear you. Cause I mean, it's like, there's a difference between like a bar, a bar show and like a, a theater show. And a that's the thing too, show. is that for comedy, the smaller the room, the better. So yeah, if, if you're performing in a big room and well, first of all, because it's easier to fill. So, you know. Yeah, but uh, you know that's the weird thing about comedy shows is that it's like people feel like they need permission to laugh sometimes. So until the first person laughs, nobody else feels like they have permission to laugh. So you know that's another thing that happens. Yeah, well, there's an open mic around here called the Big Room. It's kind of backwards, right? Yeah, uh, it's a it's a village theater, so it is a theater setting. It's not a bar. But it is a, a, a tall, wide, large, it's, it's like a playhouse, a really old playhouse that they, you know, they still have for, for theater use. And so they do the open mic, but people will sit in their own groups. It's like there's a group of people here, group of people here, group of people in the back, group of people right. kind of in the middle. And so when one group starts laughing, yeah, it's like they feel singled out. Right. Whereas if I go to like the jukebox, which is a, an actual comedy club and it's got a low ceiling and everybody's packed together in the front, right. when somebody starts laughing, other people start laughing and it, right. it spreads like a fire. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing I would say is that if, if you have one of those audiences where I want to say no one's laughing, I, I, I would say find the one person who likes your material and do your entire show for them. And hope that everyone else catches on, you know, because sometimes that's, you know, that's, it's, it's survival, you know, you just got to find your, your, your allies and the people who get you. And, uh, okay. I, or, I appreciate that, Paul. Cause like just at one of the other recent, um, jukebox mics, uh, there was a, a, a new comedian came out and a friend of his came out and was sitting next to him, you know, and, and he, the friend who was wasn't there to perform he was just there to hear jokes he was laughing he was right. laughing more so than anyone else at my right. jokes and so i was like oh this is this is my new biggest fan i'm going to buy him some donuts cuz i was telling jokes about donuts you know yeah so um i no i appreciate that i was wondering if maybe i was focusing on you know that audience member too much but um i suppose well you know it, it, it it's funny because you know, you could have some audience members, you know, digging your material. And then, you know, if you're, if you're, I don't know, if you're insecure like me, uh, you know, somehow you'll be focused on the one person who's not laughing. You know, it's like, there's, there's always that one who's just like, I, I don't know, you know, sometimes it's a whole audience. But She you know. brought me here. I didn't want to come. Well, that's another, you know, that's and John, full of tips. Uh, so that's the other tip I, I would give is that the, um, the idea is to do enough shows or so many shows that any one show, you know, isn't that important because that's another thing that happened when I was starting out is that I, when I started out, I was only doing one show a month basically with this class. So every show had to be perfect. And if it wasn't perfect, then I would get really upset. Mm -hmm. But- Ruin your month. Yeah, but if you're doing a bunch of shows, then I, I, like I just said, it's like you can do the same exact material. I've, this has happened to me many times. You can do the same exact material and you'll see if you're doing the same exact material a, a bunch of times, you're gonna see some shows for whatever reason go better than others. And you know, and there could be, you know, 
if it's the if the material if you're doing the same material it's not the material it's the audience or something else is going on you know the space is too big or you know something like that sure yeah it could be the room could be a lot of factors yeah yeah Okay. Um, well, I don't want to keep you too long, but I did want to uh, ask you what you're, what are you selling? What are you promoting? Tell us where to find oh, you. Oh, yeah. Well, I have uh, four shows coming up, as you know, uh, this Thursday at the Comic Strip, uh, next Wednesday at Adoro Lay, uh, the following Friday at Bronx Brewery, and then the following Saturday. Oh, I'm probably going to get all the dates mixed up now, but you know, it's basically like let me let me I'm look because sure. this is the 14th and i'm yeah, probably so just... gonna air this on the 20th oh fuck they're gonna miss all my shows so <laughs> yeah so so <laughs> 17th i'm at the comic strip uh the 23rd and you I were at the comic strip <laughs> i were i was at the comic strip you missed it it was a great show uh <laughs> the 23rd i'm at adoro lay okay so you'll miss the first one and see the other three and then December 2nd, I'm at Bronx Brewery. And December 3rd, I'm at Pangea, which I am also producing. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, so that's the one you should come to. No, you should come to all of them. I don't know. Anyone? Yeah, 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 absolutely. How well, many people? Well, um, okay, so and then you've got a YouTube channel, right? Yes, I do. So I'm gonna have the chat bot uh, drop that in the in the in the chats, and uh, if you get a subscriber from YouTube Administrator, that's my chat bot okay it's a uh, um so, so some people see that and they they're like is that real and because i searched circle youtube logo and got the perfect profile picture it's got a silver line around it it looks real you know like it throws some people off and so i don't want to throw you off and think oh no youtube's looking at me but i mean if you see an, an extra subscriber from youtube administrator that's just because i'm on my chatbot channel Oh, okay. Um, also, also, you have a book. That is correct. Okay. So should people check out your book or? Yes, people should check out my book. God, I really do sound like a commercial now. Uh, <laughs> no, that, that's the idea is, is well, you, you got it. You got it. You got to tell people that you're available and, and there's a point there, yeah. there's a good point for commercials. And then, you know, this is, this is that point. So, so people, people know. You can still choose to not do any of those. Um, no, but my, my book is called New York Trilogy, and should uh, it should not be confused with uh, another book called New York Trilogy by a man named Paul Oster, who is much more famous than I am. Uh, but yes, I came up with the title first, I think. Uh, yeah, and then I have also have a walking tour that is based on my book, which okay. you can also purchase. <laughs> and it's also called New York Trilogy, but it's on a different different site. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll, all of I'll... this will be on my website, paulhallisey.com. So, uh, oh, cool. Get... You have a .com. So, which uh, I can pin one link at the top of the chats. Usually, uh, I do the YouTube just because you get more rollover that way. But is there any one? But my website has links to everything else that I just, you know, okay. talked about. So that I'll pin be... the .com. Yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah. We'll see if we can get you some rollover. And uh, all right. Uh, who knows? I, they may be performing in Ohio. God help me. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I I mean, even you come out to Iowa and you could perform it like Iowa, uh get the name of the state right. <laughs> we got the rhythm city out here. That's you know okay, see? it's uh, it's right on Interstate 80. So <laughs> I'm in Ohio. I always get them mixed up. I don't know why. Uh, they, kinda, they at least near each other. I mean kind of sounds the same. They both have an O and an I and a there's an H in there somewhere, probably. Uh, I, you know, Ohio has the, the, the silent H and Iowa has the silent invisible H. That's how I say. Okay. Well, I don't know. I'm getting off track here, but <laughs> I, I won't keep you any longer. I appreciate you taking the time to join us for the interview and, uh, everybody check out paulhallisey.com and, and check out his book and his YouTube and his comedy. And he's got shows coming up. He's getting it folks. Yeah, baby. All right, let's hear from Paul Hallisey coming by and doing an interview. That was totally a thing. I'm glad I got a chance to ask him some questions about comedy and the comedy scene. And 
I really kind of wish I would do longer interviews because I could really get into the the depth of questions. And, you know, I could, like, try to stay more on point. But when I get conversational, then we, we I feel like we can dig a little deeper. It's almost like I could do, like, five-hour interviews and they would they would really get to the bottom of some things. But maybe we can do, like, multi-part interviews, which, you know, I'm hoping that I can get to do some of those as time goes on you know get that's that's part of the thing about doing the show is that over time i start to feel out you know i I have the basic format and then i i feel spots where i can improve stuff and then i can just keep cranking out the show and and doing it efficiently so that way i have the time to do it okay let's see what kind of jokes i have and if it's worth going to the open mic to tell them uh, let's see. He was talking about basil, so I, I had to tell my basil joke, or pesto joke. So I said, a magician ordered a pizza, but he didn't like the flavor. So he added some basil and shouted, pesto changeo. That's a, not a very good joke, but that's what we do on the joke portion, is unload them all. Let's see, what do I got? Oh, Shred. I'm, I'm thinking it would be inter- entertaining to see Shredder versus Wolverine in a pulled pork sandwich making contest because they both have the the claws uh, i was thinking that the word rock star is redundant because stars are also rocks giant rocks on fire in the sky a sky full of flaming rocks and see i think it's weird as i get old that people i went to high school kid with People I went to, I think it's weird, as I get older, I think it's weird that people I went to high school with have kids that are older and more responsible than I am. Let's see. If you beat the spread, it becomes light and fluffy. That's like half of a joke. It's a football joke, I think. Have you ever woken up so tired that you want to take a nap? That's called, uh what you experience after you watch the joke portion of the program. Um, Let's see. Okay, I think... Yeah, this this is where... This is where I'm going to tell my my set, my my Thanksgiving set. But I had a couple of other jokes I wanted to tell first. Um, So I realized that Walmart stocks up on a lot of food the day before Thanksgiving. And they stock up on Drano the day after. Um, Oh, Viagra has made a candy bar called Nutter Fluffer. And let's see, what do I have? I have um, my Thanksgiving set. So I wanted to talk about Thanksgiving jokes before they no longer make sense anymore. So I'm going to try and juice them for everything they're worth, which isn't much to begin with. I ask someone what their favorite Thanksgiving side dish is. You know, what's your favorite Thanksgiving side dish? Someone told me that their favorite Thanksgiving side dish is mashed potatoes, which I love mashed potatoes. I mean, I love food. That's what I'm thankful for, really. But I really love mashed potatoes. And that made me think that my favorite thing about the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade Balloons is that I can eat all the mashed potatoes and say, at least I'm not that big. Although the problem is when I eat all those mashed potatoes, I get so gassy, you have to hold me down with ropes. I also like pie. I like pumpkin pie. I like pumpkin pie almost as much as I like Cool Whip. I actually have a formula. My formula for pie is 3.14 times the amount of cool whip on top of the pumpkin pie i like i like a lot of cool whip on my pumpkin pie um upon further reflection i realized that my favorite thanksgiving side dish is actually whiskey but if i'm being honest my my serious favorite thanksgiving side dish and this is serious is gravy i love gravy i love gravy so much i i hooked it into my plumbing Yeah, you go up to the kitchen sink, there's hot, cold gravy. I love gravy so much I hooked it into the sprinkler system. 
Yeah, that's right. My my ideal gravy boat is a yacht on a lake made of gravy. And it's also shopping season, which, you know, shopping season is happening. There's a lot of people out there, so you want to be careful out there on the road. Uh, that made me think of, uh, you know, the joke I told a little while ago about how I saw a poster that says, don't drink and drive, which, you know, that, that makes me think about how I'm looking for someone who can do some body work quietly before my neighbors find out because they're really nice people and I want them to let me borrow their car again. And shopping season also means that that you get out there and you got to try those new self-checkout counters, which I don't know. Do you like the sh do you like self-checkout counters? For me they're hit or miss. I like the fact that I can dump all my spare change in there, you know, lighten the load a little bit. But I don't like dealing with all the computers. And, you know, it, it's got this camera, it's got this screen on there. It shows me how stupid I look while I'm handing over all my money. And, it, you know, these it, it was bad enough when I got a funny look from the cashier for my purchases. But now I've got these computers uploading everything I buy to the cloud. And all the websites on the internet know that a grown man just bought diet pills and ham salad. And that makes me think of another thing about shopping season. See? A lot of you don't know me, which means you don't know what to buy me for Christmas. But that's okay. I've taken the liberty of writing down a few items in what I call Jacob's Extravagant Christmas List, and I'd like to share some of them with you right now. I need some sharks with freaking lasers for my moat, you know. And I need an infrared car. I want three helicopters, sport, luxe, and military. I would like a shower caddy so that I can golf in the shower. Yeah, that's right. I want a hired ninja. I want a personal Walmart. I want a life-size replica of the Harlem Globetrotters. And I want a volcano. And, of course, I also want all of you to have a fantastic week. Thank you for coming by the show. I hope to see you next week. And the week after next, we're going to have another interview with Helene Witt. I want to thank all my guests for joining me for interviews, and I hope to see you next week, and every week, at 9 p.m. Eastern. Thank you for coming by.